Hello and welcome to episode 39 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today's highlights include the booking of a fateful meeting, a TV rehearsal, and some recording sessions. On the 8th of February 1961, the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums, performed twice in the same night. The first show, for the eighth time, was at the Aintree Institute in Liverpool for BK Promotions. Then, the lads rushed to the Humbleton Hall in Liverpool for a performance booked by Willie Hill and Vic Anton. Busy day for manager Brian Epstein in 1962. While in London trying to ascertain the Beatles' remaining Decca prospects, Epstein acquired a two reel-to-reel tape mixdown of the 15 songs recorded by the band during their Decca audition. You might recall that we covered that historic event in the very first episode of What A Fab Day. Anyhow, armed with a good quality recording of the performance, he decided to visit a number of other record companies like Pi or Oriol to study the market and weight other options. After a long run of fruitless calls, he entered the EMI-owned HMV shop in Oxford Street. He had met the shop manager, Bob Boast, the year before in Hamburg. Funny how this German city played such a central role in the life of the Beatles. They both had attended a record retail course run by Deutsche Grammophon. While Boast couldn't help the Beatles and Epstein's cause directly, he urged Epstein to use the tape to make a number of 68 run per minute demo discs, using the studio on the first floor of the building. Epstein followed the advice and, while upstairs, Sound engineer Jim Foy commented favorably about the band, even more so when he learned that three of those 15 songs had been written by the performers themselves. It was uncommon in the early 1960s to have recording artists who wrote their own material, and it certainly was an asset for the band. Through Foy, Epstein came in contact with Ardmore and Beechwood, one of EMI publishing companies, ending up in the office of general manager Sid Coleman. Coleman was interested in the band for a publishing deal, but Epstein, while interested, had his priorities in order. The band needed a record contract first and foremost. Coleman then placed a call to the head of A&R at Parlophone Records, George Martin. Parlophone was the smallest EMI subsidiary, mainly known for comedy records. It had little budget, hits or prestige, but Epstein was more than happy to be able to go back to Liverpool with a sense of having accomplished something tangible. He had booked a meeting with Martin for the 13th of February. In 1963, the Beatles performed at the ABC Cinema in Carlisle for the Helen Shapiro Package Tour. After the two shows, as customary, every date of the tour featured two performances in the same venue, the Beatles, Shapiro and fellow performer Kenny Lynch were ejected from a Carlisle Golf Club dance at the Crown and Mitre Hotel in the city centre, after Ringo Starr had tried to enter the premises while sporting a leather jacket. The incident made the local news and saw the whole tour received a bit of extra publicity. In 1964, the Beatles started their first day in New York City with a press conference in the Baroque Room of the Plaza Hotel. After that, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr went for a walk in Central Park, followed by 400 mostly female fans and several photographers. George Harrison stayed back to the hotel with a really high fever due to a streptococcal infection. Joined in his room by his sister Louise and a doctor, he was advised against appearing at the Ed Sullivan show. His infection was treated with a robust intake of drugs to be administered every hour on the hour. After lunch, 
the three healthy Beatles jumped on a limousine and reached the CBS's Studio 50 on Broadway for their first rehearsal for their appearance during the Ed Sullivan show. It was not a quiet trip. The car was charged by screaming fans and mounted police had to intervene to restore order. The rehearsals started at 1.30 p.m., with 10 mounted policemen guarding the entrance and 52 officers inside the TV studio. The Beatles joined the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, the American equivalent of the Musicians' Union, and then rehearsed their bit with their roadie Neil Aspinall standing for Harrison. The Beatles impressed the studio crew with their politeness and professional attitude, and were the first band ever to request to see a playback of their rehearsal. After the affair, the Beatles gave ample opportunity to the various members of the press, paper and radio to interview them. In the evening, with George still confined to his bed, John, Paul and Ringo were joined by George Martin and several executives from Capitol Records for a dinner at the 21 restaurant. On the 8th of February 1966, George Harrison and his wife Patty left London for the Barbados for the start of their honeymoon. On this date in 1967, the Beatles were back at the EMI Studios to start recording a new song, Good Morning, Good Morning. Beatles historian Mark Lewison maintains that the title of the track was inspired by the BBC Kellogg's Conflakes commercial. Whatever the case, the four taped eight takes of the rhythm track, comprising drums, tambourine, rhythm guitar and guide vocals by John Lennon. For those who don't know, a guide vocal is a temporary vocal track that just serves to give everyone the outline of the melody. The lyrics might be wrong, or the performance might be a bit shabby, but it doesn't matter, because it just serves as a kind of signpost. The session, starting at 7 pm, was wrapped up at 2.15 am. Finally, between 2.30 and 9 pm of the 8th of February 1968, the Beatles were at the EMI Studios in Abbey Road. After completing the inner light with a quick vocal overdub by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the band focused on Across the Universe adding mellotron, organ and wordless three-part harmonies, discarding those of a dubs and settling for an electric guitar part enriched by piano and maracas. Despite all the work, at the end of the session John was still unsatisfied with the result and so, during the 10pm to 12.15am mixing session, he agreed to the group decision to have Lady Madonna as a single with the inner light on its B-side. Comedian Spike Milligan, George Martin's guest at the session, asked if Across the Universe could be included on a charity album for the World Wildlife Fund. Permission was granted, but the album, No One's Gonna Change Our World, was issued only in December 1969, so the song remained dormant until October 1969, when wildlife sound effects were superimposed onto the track. This concludes today's episode of What A Fab Day. Please remember sharing it with your friends so that the show gets more listeners and I can feel that all the work I am putting into it is worth something. In the episode description, you will find a link to the bibliography of the podcast, full of Amazon affiliate links. It is just one of the ways to support my efforts please visit www.simonmas.com support to find others. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.